So this is Ben and Mara with Stellar Strategy Gaming. Today we're talking about D&D, &D, everybody's favorite tabletop role game. And in particular, what we're going to be talking about are two of the harder races to play, which are the Kenku and the Lizard Folk. Yes, and this actually really came to mind because there's a bit of a lull in playing D&D &D during the global situation, so we've really gotten a chance to look at character creation a lot more just because we have more time to do it, really. And what we noticed when looking at these characters, or these species for characters, is that I find that the Kenku and the lizard folk both have the problem where they're almost intentionally hard to play. They're, they're uh, by comparison to all the other races, they're actually too inhuman for a, a player character to play correctly. So I'd like to go into a little bit more detail about what the issues with each of these are, starting with the Kenku. For those not familiar, they are a humanoid avian race. In other words, they're bird people. Their backstory is that they angered whatever demon or god or whatever it was they once served and that creature punished them by <clears throat> removing their ability to fly um, removing their creativity and removing their ability to come up with sort of their own words and sentences so what that means is that they are they're the size of smallish people they're i think between five and five foot six and they can think and speak, but they can't come up with their own ideas. They can perfectly mimic anything they've heard. One of the things that the, I've got the handbook for it open there, listed in Volo's Guide to Monsters, the playable race for both Kenku and Lizard Folk. It tells us that the Kenku do dream of flying. They want to learn how to fly again through magic or whatever means. And it does describe their ability to mimic sounds. They've heard not just speech, but any sound. One of the things I've noticed here is it doesn't tell us any specific number of sentences or sounds they can have memorized. Yes, and what immediately comes up with the memory issue especially, and not even getting into their creative block effectively, is just the fact that with that memory trait, it tends to come off as very obnoxious or annoying if not done exactly right. You're either mimicking the party members, which I find just isn't creative. It's, it's a very good... You, you play a Kenku character if you're lazy and you don't really want to come up with your own ideas. That's at least the, the normal player who's not dedicated to new ideas might do that. And so with, with Memory that that really is a problem. It's just... There, there's no creativity there, and on top of that, it's the copying the words of someone else is always going to come off annoying, especially if you've got the actor member of your group who's going to try to exactly mimic the speech patterns of someone else. It's it, it's not fun to listen to. It's not fun to play. It's it, if not done perfectly, it can really be obnoxious. I completely get that. It can also be a problem where. Normal people, you know, people in everyday life do sometimes have go-to phrases that they repeat. For example, if something was more trouble than it was worth, my father always used to say it was too much sugar for a dime, which is apparently a very old Southern expression. But if that's all somebody's speech pattern is, it could get, uh, it could certainly get grating. I had a couple of ideas for things that you could do to make them more sort of bearable. The Volo's guy does specifically say constant attempts to mimic noises can come across as confusing or irritating rather than entertaining. You can just as easily describe the sounds your character makes and what they mean, unless you're intentionally trying to be confusing. One thing, a couple of things that had come to mind for me, one is you should probably work out with your DM and maybe the other players. It's always a good idea to have a session zero, especially if you're playing sort of weird characters like this. Work out with your DM and the other players how this is actually going to work, starting with how many sentences can your Kenku have memorized. Because I can see some very interesting scenarios where Maybe the Kenku has learned something and is trying to convey it to the party, but has no direct way to do it. 
Also, an idea that came to mind for me with a Kenku would be to do a Kenku Bard, because if they're able to remember long stretches of things, then theoretically that might be a very good storyteller or, or just an excellent musician. Yes, uh, I, I completely agree with those. The, that, that definitely works to negate or at least make the memory significantly more interesting. But moving to the other problem, which you talked about earlier, is there create a block, and I'm not sure if it's a specific trait, but it actually will be something that we also touch on with the lizard folk. It makes their minds again, too inhuman by comparison to the other races, like orcs, elves, humans, t tieflings, whatever it is, Asimar, they all have basic human emotions and human thinking patterns, even if they're in a slightly different way than base humans. And so that, that makes it that makes it so that they're playable, but you can do something different with them. With a Kenku, their, their lack of creativity really is difficult because, for example... If you have a hairpin, but your Kenku has never seen someone lockpick with a hairpin, it could not, by the lore standards, come up with its own idea to lockpick something. Someone else would have to suggest it. And while hopefully your party is kind enough to do that, at the same time that could be incredibly frustrating as well, and makes it very difficult. It, it's not with Memory where it's an issue in building the character, that becomes an issue with continuously playing the character for long stretches of time, especially because between levels 5 and 10 is where you need the most creativity because I find that that's where the power transition starts. So you tend to take a lot more damage and take a lot more risks then. And so for most players, you'll find that they start finding ways around those problems. If a Kenku can't do that, it's a death sentence. Yes, actually, now that you mention it, one of the things that does come to mind, it's actually been an issue in some of the campaigns I've played. I'm very fond of the spell Minor Illusion. It creates a an illusion within a, I believe it's five foot by five foot by five foot cube. And you can get really creative with how you use the spell. So, for example, make it appear that there's a copy of you crouching in that space to confuse your enemy, or maybe make something you can crouch and hide behind, even though there's nothing physically there. You could essentially make yourself invisible. With a Kenku character, you'd be very limited in your ability to... Because unless the Kenku had seen somebody do that, or unless somebody had suggested it, you're absolutely right. It wouldn't be able to come up with the idea. Something as simple as the Kenku being hungry and seeing an apple on a tree, unless it had seen somebody pick an apple or somebody told it how to pick an apple, told them how to pick an apple, the Kenku wouldn't be able to come up with that idea on its own. It... I mean, it could be interesting to the right kind of role player because it, it is something where it, it creates this all-consuming problem of what, how is this Kenku going to know things and function. But I, I could definitely see it's not a, it's not a pick-up-and-play character at all. It's not for a novice player. And I, I feel like that should be more clearly spelled out in the description. And I also, the, the issue with not having a specific number of sayings or, or, or mimicries that it, can, uh, that it can do, that it has memorized, is also kind of a problem. Yes. And with that, with a few suggestions down for the Kenku, I think we should probably transfer on to Lizard Folk. Uh, and with that, actually, I was... Th this one is the one that stands out to me. Is It doesn't have the same problems as a Kenku for the most part, but it does have one major similarity, which is that the, the th thought processes are incredibly different to that of a human. Lizard folk have almost no traditionally human emotions. If you have helped a lizard folk 20 times in its life, and then suddenly you go down, what the lizard folk is going to be thinking is, ooh, a new body to eat. It's not... The lizard folk, as described in the book and as described in some other segments of lore, is so fo is focused on its own survival above all else, and so what that and because it can't easily comprehend human emotions unless it's a scholarly study, it, it won't play well with other people. It doesn't have the same interactions. I can definitely see that being a problem. It's a problem. I actually had a character who was not a lizard folk. He was, you played in a campaign with this character. He was a half elf and specifically half drow. 
who had grown up among, among the drow and had learned sort of drow values or lack thereof. And because he was only half drow, he was even more, his method of survival was to be even more aggressive, even more sort of dangerous. And it was a fun and interesting character to play, but it was also the kind of thing where you can very quickly start to derail a campaign if the DM and the rest of the party aren't on board with it. I think with a lizard folk, this is one of those cases where you really need to have discussions ahead of time about what kind of characters are appropriate for a campaign. Because if you're going through, for example, an enchanted elven forest with a lizard folk, I could definitely see that having a bad ending. But if it starts out with the party as, for example, a group of mercenaries, and the lizard folk is one of the mercenaries that is hired, the, the lizard folk could come to, at an intellectual level, value, okay, this person has saved me several times. If I now save them, maybe they will help me again in the future. So lizard folk do have, uh, do have, they don't have human-like emotion, but they do have human-like intelligence. So they would be capable of thinking that through. They, one, one way I like to think of the lizard folk is they could be a little bit, you could play them a little bit like a, a little bit more beefy and aggressive version of Spock from Star Trek or the Vulcans from Star Trek, where they might not word it exactly this way, but everything is a, is a state of pure logic to them. And it may not be logical to save that halfling village because, well, the halflings are just going to get wiped out anyway. Yes, um, that actually, part of that comes to my next issue with them is their speech pattern is it, it falls into the same thing as mimicry but in a but it's flavored differently effectively lizard folk as presented can only speak in actions they do not speak in past or future tense when they say for example i, I could say i just did the dishes um whereas a lizard folk would say uh this t uh the dishes are now done for me to now be able to go do something else. It, it creates this very long sentence for them to be able to convey that they've done something. They very rarely think of the future tense. And on top of that, it it can come off as obnoxious if done by especially the actor person. Over, if it's overdone, it can be really painful as an experience. But at the same time, if it's underdone, you're not playing a lizard folk at that point. There's a there's a very sensitive middle ground to be reached, with a lot which a lot of people don't understand. I'm actually seeing a text block here, which I believe uh, Ben here is reading. So. Yes, yeah, so what it says, there's a specific text block in Volo's guide for lizard folk speech. Lizard folk can master common. Their mind spite results in speech patterns distinct from other humanoids. Lizard folk rarely use metaphors. Their speech is almost always literal. They might pick up idioms, but only with some difficulty. Names confuse them unless they are descriptive. They tend to apply their own naming conventions to other creatures using common words. Lizard folks use active verbs to describe the world. Lizard folk in cold weather might say the wind brings cold rather than I feel cold. Lizard folk tend to define things in terms of actions rather than effects. So a lizard folk would have a hard time saying, I did the dishes, or the dishes are done, but, but it would be able to say, actually, no, I'm sorry, the lizard folk would say, I did the dishes, as opposed to dishes are clean. Or it might be, one way to think of it might be, for example, in Spanish, you don't say, I am hungry, yo tengo hambre is, I have hunger. And it might, you would have to think of it in some kind of terms like that. And... There again, it, it's it's you're going to have to have a discussion with your party about to what extent you want to act something like this out, and you're going to have to be honest with yourself about what your capacity to act something like this out is. Actually, in a campaign you played with me, I don't remember the character's name, but uh, a person we were playing with, about halfway through the campaign, he realized he couldn't play his character because his character was significantly more intelligent than he was. He's playing like, like a hyper intelligent rogue type, so you can if you can't sort of delve into this mindset. I think this would be true with either the lizard folk or the kenku. If you can't delve into the mindset of what's being described with these characters, and if you can't get your DM or your party on board, you really should uh, go with a different character. Yeah, and the last thing I'll say uh, before before we end it here is 
Consider that the lizard folk, as described, are very much like Drax in Guardians of the Galaxy 1. You know, it, it can be done right. Drax was objectively funny in Guardians of the Galaxy 1 because of his lack of understanding. The problem comes in a long campaign when you turn from Guardians of the Galaxy 1 Drax to Guardians of the Galaxy 2 Drax, where you just start slowing everything down because either he overcame the obstacle off-screen or he's just forcing an interaction with everything to seem funny, you know? It's, there is a difference between the two Draxes, and that, that is the same danger with the lizard folk, is if done well, it can come off as Guardians of the Galaxy 1 Drax, but if done unwell, it can come off as the second one, where it just slows the campaign down. So, and uh, that's, that's where we're going to leave it. Please leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more of this. We'll be continuing with exploration of both D&D &D and Grand Strategy going forward.